I have nothing against Russian nationalists or great Russia, said Dmitri as he sped through the dark Mariupol night in a pickup truck. A machine gunner positioned in the back, but Putin's not even a Russian. Putin's a Jew. Words not spoken, that's part of how propaganda works. You just let people forget. If they're already forgetting, don't remind them. I'm Rodney Swearingen. It has been said that the first casualty in war is the truth. I would like to take a look at this first casualty as seen in the recent events in the Ukraine. I would like to start this series on the first casualty in Ukraine by discussing certain words that are not mentioned in 2022. And of course, this has to do with uh, Russian propaganda and the censorship that's going on in Russia right now regarding the Ukraine war, uh, where journalists and other people are not allowed to say that it is a war. Um, but I do want to point out, uh, you know, compare that with a certain kind of censorship that takes place in the United States and is taking place actually right at this moment. And just compare those two things. And I should say right at the top here that uh, my interest is in propaganda and ideology, an analysis of propaganda and ideology. And this is a long standing uh, research interest of mine. And it's just that during wartime, you get a kind of propaganda that is particularly heavy handed and clunky and and it's a little easier to see the propaganda at work during wartime uh, because, you know, uh, propaganda is one of the tools of war. Uh, so it's uh, used quite blatantly uh, by any any party that is engaged in war. Uh, that's just you know part of the arsenal and uh and so you know i'm providing an analysis of propaganda and ideology and i don't want to or i don't intend to engage in propaganda or um, express ideological views uh you know to the extent that i'm able to do that um, especially with ideology it's often difficult to see your own ideology but you know my intention is just to do a a cool-headed and uh, somewhat objective analysis of propaganda from the perspective of an a, a united states citizen okay and and i'll explain more you know exactly what i mean by the uh, after this little introduction and what i want to do is to read a few news articles and make some commentary on them and uh and in the process of this comparing and contrasting uh i hope to to uh, show you the kind of analysis that i want to do in this series so first of all i wanted to look at this Al Jazeera article. And this is, you know, the kind of propaganda that I'm sure we've all heard about in the US news media. Uh, you, you know, notice that you are typically consuming media produced in and for the United States. And, and other Western uh, allies, um, you're not actually typically reading or viewing Russia pro propaganda. You're, you're getting a sense of Russia propaganda from secondhand accounts. So here's one of the, uh, a secondhand account that kind of summarizes, you know, a big issue that's going on uh, with Russia propaganda at the moment. 
do not call Ukraine invasion a war, Russia tells media schools. Instead, special military operation should be used to describe Moscow's assault on Ukraine, according to officials. Okay, this is from uh, March 2nd of 2022. As Russia's bloody military operation against Ukraine nears the end of its first week, the Kremlin has been working hard to promote its version of events in the face of widespread indignation and anti-war movement at home. And an anti-war movement at home, which has nearly seen nearly 7,000 people arrested across the country since the conflict began on Thursday. For instance, a statement by Russia's Internet Censor Board, Roskomnazor, sorry, warns that referring to the ongoing military campaign as an invasion, attack, or declaration of war will lead to the offending website being blocked. Okay. Since Tuesday, schools across Russia have hosted special war-themed social studies classes where teachers must tell school children between the 7th and 11th grades the official government's uh, the official government's position on history and what the Kremlin deems the special operation. The lessons are guided by manuals distributed through the school system that outline the approved version of events. According to one such manual, the contents of which were published by the independent Russian media outlet Media Zona, the Ukrainian nation did not exist until the 20th century and in 2014 suffered a bloody coup d'etat that installed an American puppet regime. The story goes that after the self-described Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics in eastern Ukraine rose up against it, they were besieged and subjected to a genocide for eight years, which Russia is now preventing through a special peacekeeping operation. The materials explicitly state this is not a war. The manual also mentions NATO and how Russian security concerns were ignored by Washington as another reason for the necessary military operation, as well as Ukraine's capacity under its current rapidly anti-Russian leadership to build nuclear weapons. A source at a school in a Russian city told Al Jazeera by phone that they had received similar manuals and in a public school, teachers had no choice but to carry out these lessons in the framework of history or social studies and provide proof they're doing so. As in the approved media narrative, they are not allowed to refer to the ongoing military campaign as a war or invasion, but as a special operation. The source added that the opinions among teachers vary depending on their age, but even amongst those who generally support uh, President Vladimir Putin, there are those who are horrified by the war. Additionally, parents have received letters from their children's schools warning them to keep an eye on their children's consumption of social media, such as TikTok, where they may be encouraged to use the hashtag no to war and be drawn into unsafe protest, as well as be exposed to other malfeasance such as suicide flash mobs, detailed instructions on gender reassignment, and promotion of same-sex relationships. In recent years, promoting military and patriotic education to the nation's youth has been a priority. A uniform youth army was formed in 2015. Hundreds of thousands of children aged 8 to 18 were taught how to use weapons and instilled with patriotic values at regularly attended camps. Okay, so that's from Al Jazeera. Uh, so, so there we get a taste of the kind of propaganda, and, and this is something that uh, U.S. citizens are very concerned about, um, rightly so, that, uh, you know, especially the children in Russia are being misled about, about the facts of of what's going on now in Ukraine and the history of Ukraine, that that's being somehow distorted. Um, next, I wanna look at uh, this Associated Press explainer. And, and now this is something, I mean, all of this that, that I'm reading to you is, is intended for 
a United States or Western audience. Um, but uh, here you have the Associated Press, and, and the Associated Press is a, uh, a service set up by uh, journalists, uh, uh, you know, by publishers of major newspapers. And what happens with the Associated Press is uh, journalists are in a pool of journalists, and, and they're um, especially journalists who are stationed abroad uh, throughout the world. They, um, they act on behalf of the Associated Press and do quick uh, informational uh, pieces about something going on in a particular hotspot, especially, and then, and then uh, major newspapers like the New York Times or the Washington Post, etc., they republish those pieces both in the New York Times and the Washington Post and anybody else who who uh, belongs to the association and they can uh, publish these pieces. And so often you'll see Associated Press uh, 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 credited with stories in the major newspapers. This is how they kind of fill in the gaps with their own reporters uh, covering certain events, and then you have these Associated Press pieces that can fill in the gaps and, and kind of complete the story. And usually they're pretty um, low key. They try to be, uh, n you know, not uh, hyperbolic. Use a less uh, loaded language and and stick to the facts. Um, but um, you know, so this is a very good source. Typically, the Associated Press is a very good source. Uh, for high quality journalism, um, because they're, you know, that's what they're tasked with is being, you know, kind of from an objective, universal view that can be picked up by any paper. Um, and, and so I want to, I want to take a look at this. So, so in Russia, you can't say war, but notice what you cannot say if you belong to the Associated Press. Okay, so this is from April 22nd. So this is a few days ago. I'm, I'm recording this on April 28th. Um, so explainer, Ukraine war, why the battle for Mariupol's Avastol steel plant matters. The vast Avastol iron and steel works is the last holdout of Ukrainian forces in the devastated port city of Mariupol. Russian President Vladimir Putin on Thursday claimed the liberation of Mariupol after nearly two months of fighting. And here's a picture of the steelworks, uh, quite interesting. Uh, it is a massive complex with, um, with a kind of underground city beneath it uh, that was built in, during the Soviet era. And that's where the Ukrainian uh, 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 Marines, I believe they are, are, are held up, uh, hold up underground in this bunker that was designed as a bunker with its own medical facilities and things like that, um, along with uh, their family members and, and some other citizens from, from Mariupol. So there are some um, civilians down there. So, so there's a, you know, a, a piece about why uh, this is important. Okay.
Okay, so I had some issues with that that earlier version of the website, but here we see um, uh, before we were looking at South China Morning Post, who picked up this AP story on the 22nd of April. Here is the Globe and Mail picking up this Associated Press um, article on the 21st of April. Okay, so uh, why the Battle of Mariupol's Avastel steel plant matters in Russia's war against Ukraine? Russian President Vladimir Putin is claiming control over Ukraine's port city of Mariupol, even as its defenders are still holed out at a giant steel mill by the seaside. His statement reflected the importance of the city on the Sea of Azov and appeared to be an attempt to declare victory without storming the last pocket of Ukrainian resistance there, the massive Avastol plant. Why is Mariupol important? Good question. You know, we've been hearing a lot about this. Uh, Mariupol, which is part of the industrial region in eastern Ukraine, known as the Donbas, has been a key Russian objective since the February 24th invasion began. Capturing the city would allow the establishment of a land corridor from Russia's border to Ukraine's Crimean Peninsula that Moscow annexed in 2014. It also would deprive Ukraine of a major port and prized industrial asset. The seven-week siege has tied up significant numbers of Russian forces, which are badly needed for an offensive elsewhere in the Donbass. The region is where Moscow-backed separatists have been fighting Ukrainian government forces since 2014 after the Crimean annexation. So that region of the Donbass, which Mariupol is located within the Donbass region. So it's, it's within this civil war uh, area, this area where the civil war has been taking place since 2014. How has the Russian siege gone? Since it began on March 1st, the Russian military has pummeled Mariupol relentlessly with all artillery barrages and air raids, flattening most of the once bustling city. The indiscriminate bombardment has hit homes, hospitals, and other public building, buildings, killing thousands. That includes about 300 people killed in an airstrike on the Mariupol Drama Theater that was being used as a shelter, with officials inscribing the Russian word for children, quote unquote, in huge white letters on the pavement outside. Um, I might be able to say more about that in the future. That's an interesting case. Uh, uh, so if I if I remember, I'll come I'll come back to that in a later video. Uh, Mayor Vadim Boychenko told the Associated Press that at least twenty one thousand people were killed in Mariupol, with bodies carpeted throughout through the streets. He said Russia's deployed mobile cremation equipment to methodically dispose of the remains in order to destroy evidence of the massacre and prevent international organizations from documenting, quote, the horror of Russian uh, of the Russian army, uh, the horror the Russian army is responsible for. He alleged bodies also were dumped into mass graves outside the city. 
Uh, that's another interesting case. I don't have all the documentation, but that would be something that would be interesting to look at uh, when we have better evidence on that. He estimated that 120,000 people remain in Mariupol out of a pre-war population of about 450,000. Okay. How has Ukraine responded? Ukraine conducted some of its best, uh, concentrated some of its best troops, uh, best troops, that's, that's significant, to defend Mariupol. They include the 36th Marine Brigade, Interior Ministry troops, Border Guards, and the National Guard's Azov Regiment. That Azov Regiment is, is very important here. And something that this is what I want to draw attention to is this Azov Regiment. The regiment is a seasoned volunteer force that is widely considered one of Ukraine's most capable units and has single has been singled out by Russia as a particular villain because of its far right ideology. Far right ideology. Moscow has deployed fighters from Chechnya known for their ferocity to wage street battles in Mariupol. Chechnya's Moscow backed leader. Ramzan Kadriov has repeatedly boasted on social media about defeating Ukrainians in Mariupol, but the fight has continued. After weeks of house-to-house -house battles in which Russia has incurred massive losses, including several senior officers, Mariupol's defenders hold up at the last remaining pocket of resistance, the mammoth Avastol plant that employed 10,000 workers before the war. Why is the battle for the steel mill taken so long, so long. A few thousand Ukrainian troops by Moscow's estimate remain in the plant, which covers an area of nearly 11 square kilometers, over 4.2 square miles. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has said about 1,000 civilians were also trapped in the plant. Avastol has a 24 kilometer, 15 mile labyrinth of underground tunnels and passages which allow its defenders to maneuver freely to repel the Russian attacks. Before the war, Ukrainian authorities prepared for the Russian offensive by building up stockpiles of food and water at Avastol. So they'd stocked up on supplies to, to last out a long time. The plant covers a huge area and the Ukrainians can move through the underground tunnels to quickly change locations, said Ukrainian military expert Ole uh, Zadanov. The Avastol is nearly hard, is very hard to storm and the Russians risk losing many troops, resources, and most importantly, time there. Uh, Zadanov said it is a city within a city and fighting there could take months. He added that as long as Mariupol holds, the Russians can't redeploy 10 to 12 of their elite units to other areas in eastern Ukraine. The city keeps distracting the Russian army forces and thwarting the Kremlin plans for offensive in the Donbas. How is Putin portraying the battle for Mariupol? Putin met Thursday with Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu, Shoigu who said the entire city except Avastol is now under Russian control. It would take three to four days to flush the Ukrainian troops out of the still mill, he added. In a tightly choreographed televised meeting, Putin congratulated the military, saying that putting such an important center in the south as Mariupol under control is a success. At the same time, he ordered Shogu not to spin, send troops to Avastol to finish off the resistance so as to avoid losses. Instead, the plant would be sealed tightly so that not even a fly comes through. The remarks appeared to reflect Putin's attempt to claim victory without a bloody all-out assault of the plant in hopes that its defenders will surrender after running out of food and ammunition. Putin said nothing about halting a bombardment of the plan, which will probably continue. How is Ukraine responding? Alexei Arostovich, an advisor to Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky, mocked Putin's claim of victory, saying it reflects the fact that the Russian military cannot physically capture Avastol. Retired British Rear Admiral, Admiral Chris Perry described Putin's remarks as a sign of a shift in approach, observing that the Russian agenda now is not to capture these really difficult places where Ukrainians 
can hold out in the urban centers, but to try and capture territory and also to encircle the Ukrainian forces and declare a huge victory. Perry likened the Ukrainian resistance in Mariupol to the Battle of Stalingrad in the Soviet Union during World War II, where Stalingrad was uh, besieged by Nazis, uh, in which the Red Army routed the Nazis, blocking the city in a key turning point in World War II. Uh, so notice that we do get the word Nazis here. So Nazis are mentioned. I think there's a great totemic value in the Ukrainians holding on to Mario Mariupol. Uh, totemic, symbolic. So this is a symbolic victory, Perry said. If the Ukrainians can hang on to it, uh, elevated to the level of Stalingrad, then I think it's going to be a major lever for them, both in the propaganda war, but also on the ground campaign as well. Commanders of Ukrainian unions at the plant made a series of desperate video appeals in recent days, saying they are clinging by a thread and begged for help. Major Sergei Volinsky of the 36th Marine Brigade said in a video Wednesday that we are probably facing our last days, if not hours, adding that the enemy outnumbers us 10 to 1. He appealed and pleaded to all world leaders to help us. We appeal and plead to all world leaders to help us, he said, asking world leaders to help safely evacuate the plant's defenders and civilians hold up there. Zelensky said about 1,000 civilians could be taking shelter in the plant and that we are open to different formats of exchange of our people for Russian people, Russian military that have been, uh, that have, that they have left behind. But he added that Russia has stonewalled Ukraine's attempts for a negotiated exit. Uh, ba, 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 ba. And that's the end of the story. Okay, so uh, what, what I want to draw attention to here is that there, so just like in, in uh, Russia, the journalists cannot say war, in the Western media, and the Associated Press is a good representative of mainstream uh, journalism, in the West, uh, especially in English, um, based out of the United States, uh, in the US press, you can't say neo-Nazi. So there's no mention of neo-Nazi in here. Uh, and, and this may not, you know, this may not uh, register for you if you've been, uh, you know, just paying, t paying attention to recent coverage of, of, uh, of the war in Ukraine, you know, from the Western perspective, from Western media. Uh, but if, uh, if you were paying attention to issues revolving around Ukraine over the last couple of years, you may be like, wait, I, I've heard of the Azov Battalion referred to in that previous article as the Azov Regiment, they're called a regiment now, in, in the National Guard. Um, but they've been around since 2014, and it's been kind of a, a, a big issue uh, up until Russia invaded, up until Russia invaded Ukraine uh, in 2022, um, this has been a concern actually from Western journalists. Uh, here we have an example of Sean Walker of The Guardian. Um, and he wrote this article back in 2014, September of 2014. And it says, Azov fighters are Ukraine's greatest weapon, as was alluded to in that uh, Associated Press explainer. They're one of the greatest assets of the Ukrainian military. Uh, but Azov fighters are Ukraine's greatest weapon and may be its greatest threat. The, the battalion's far-right volunteers, 
as said by the Associated Press, desired to bring the fight to Kiev as a danger to post-conflict stability. Okay. Uh, I have, quote, I have nothing against Russian nationalists or, Rus or, or Great Russia, said Dmitry as he sped through the dark Mariupol night in a pickup truck. A machine gunner positioned in the back, but Putin's not even a, a Russian. Putin's a Jew. Okay, so the uh, Sean Walker here is traveling with a Azov uh, fighter uh, volunteer in Mariupol. This is in 2014. And the Azov battalion uh, was based out of Mariupol. And so this all makes sense. Okay. Dmitry, which he said is not his real name, is a native of East Ukraine and a member of the Azov Battalion, a volunteer grouping that has been doing much of the frontline fighting in Ukraine's war with pro-Russian separatists. The Azov, one of many volunteer brigades to fight alongside the Ukrainian army in the east of the country has developed a reputation for its fearlessness in battle. Okay, so this is, you know, they are uh, one of the strongest uh, components of the Ukrainian military. They're fighting in the east in the Donbass, as was mentioned in the previous article. Um, <clears throat> and they're based out of Mariupol. Um, Okay, but there is an increasing worry that while the Azov and other volunteer battalions might be Ukraine's most potent and reliable force on the battlefield against the separatists, they also pose the most serious threat to the Ukrainian government, and perhaps even the state, when the conflict in the East is over. Okay, this is back in 2014, still not over. It wasn't over at the beginning of 2022, and it certainly isn't over now. The Azov causes particular concern due to the far-right, even neo-Nazi leanings of many of its members. Okay, so in 2014, Western journalists were allowed to say the word neo-Nazi in connection with the Azov Battalion. But in 2022, you know, as evidenced by the example of the Associated Press, which is very typical of what's going on right now in 2022, they may be referred as right wing, uh, far right wing, but rarely, if ever, but certainly sometimes, but rarely are referred to now as neo-Nazis when that was the biggest concern about them in 2014. Dimitri claimed to, to not to be a Nazi, but waxed lyrical about Adolf Hitler as a military leader, and he believes the Holocaust never happened. Not everyone in the Azov Battalion thinks like Dmitri. Not everyone. Uh, some, yes. Everyone, no. So yeah, there's a little bit of subtlety here. Some of the Azov Battalion members, not every one of them. I see that you know people like to make that distinction. So some means some. Uh, not everyone, not all, some in the Azov Battalion thinks like Dmitri, but after speaking with dozens of its fighters and embedding on several missions during the past week and in, in and around the strategic port city of Mariupol, the Guardian found many of them to have disturbing political views and almost all to be intent on bringing the fight to Kiev when the war in the East is over. The battalion symbol is reminiscent of the Nazi wolf's angle, though the battalion claims it is in fact meant to be the letters N and I crossed over each other, standing for the national idea. Many of its members have links to with neo-Nazi groups. He said it again. And even those who laughed off the idea that they are neo-Nazis, again, did not give the most convincing denials. Uh, and this Wolf's, angle, uh, this Wolf's Angle symbol is, <clears throat> is highly associated with the 
SS in uh, in uh, during World War II, the SS um, who carried out the Holocaust uh, during World War II. And uh, there are official insignias that also uh, contain other SS symbols of the Azov Battalion. So it's, it's not just this one symbol, there's, there's multiple, at least two um, uh, SS symbols that they use um, frequently and even in their official insignia. Uh, so you might want to take a look at that. That's kind of interesting. Um, did I lose my place here? All right, all right, yeah, yeah. Of course not. It's it's all made up. There are just a lot of people who are interested in Nordic mythology, said one fighter when asked if there were neo-Nazis in the battalion. When asked what his own political views were, however, he said, a national socialist, that Nazi is, a, is an abbreviation for national socialist. As for the swastika tattoos on at least one man seen in the Azov base, the swastika has nothing to do with the Nazis. It, has an ancient, it, is, it was an ancient sun symbol, he claimed. The battalion has even drawn far-right volunteers from, uh, oh, and I should say that, that uh, the swastika is an ancient symbol coming from India um, and, and still used to this day, uh, for example, by Jains who are um, similar to, to Buddhists um, and come out of the same time period as, as Buddhism. Uh, and they use uh, the swastika uh, even to this day, you know, because it's their symbol before it was the Nazis. But uh, but nonetheless, in the West, you know, in Europe, the swastika usually means if you've got a swastika tattoo, it usually means you're a Nazi. Neo-Nazi. Okay. We're not in World War II. The battalion has even drawn far-right volunteers from abroad, such as Mikhail Skillet, a 37-year-old Swede trained as a sniper in the Swedish army who described himself as an ethnic nationalist and fights on the front line with the battalion. Despite the presence of these elements, Russian propaganda that claims gives fascist junta wants to cleanse East Ukraine of Russian speakers is overblown. The Azov are a minority among the Ukrainian forces, and even they, however unpleasant their views may be, are not anti-Russian. In fact, the lingua franca of the battalion is Russian, and the majority of them have Russians, uh, Russian as their first language. Okay. So the Azov battalion is from the east of the country, and you know, in the Donbas, and typically in the Donbas, uh, Russian is, is favored. Uh, especially by older people over Ukrainian. Okay. And Azov Battalion is, is part of this ethnic group. Uh, okay, indeed, much of what Azov members say about race and nationalism is strikingly similar to the views of the more radical Russian nationalists fighting with the separatist side. Okay, so you have uh, nationalists on both sides of this civil war, and they engage in the same kind of nationalist ideology and talk. The battalion even has a Russian volunteer, a Russian volunteer, a 30-year-old from St. Petersburg who refused to give his name. He said he views many of the Russian rebel commanders positively, especially Igor Strelkov, a former SF, SFB officer who was a who has a passion for military reenactments and appears to see himself as a czarist officer. He wants to resurrect a great Russia, said the volunteer, but Strelkov is only a pawn in Putin's game, he said, and he hoped that Russia would sometime have a nationalist, violent Maidan of its own. And uh, Maidan is, uh, is the, the revolution that took place in 2014 
that kind of set off this whole civil war. Um, in the West, it's viewed as a legitimate overthrow of uh, autocratic puppet of Putin. In the east of Ukraine, where the, the separatists, as they call them, um, really autonomous, who wanted autonomous existence for the Donbass, um, uh, apart from Ukraine, um, they see Maidan as the, the thing that set off the civil war and that legitimates their wanting to separate from Ukraine because they saw the Maidan revolution as a coup d'etat. Okay. And, and technically, it was a coup d'etat. Okay. So there's, there's, there's no question about that. It's just whether it was it a legitimate coup d'etat or, or are there, you know, is there some reason to be skeptical about it? And that's something that I'll have more to say about later. On one afternoon earlier this week, the Guardian traveled with a group of Azov fighters to hand over several boxes of bullets to Ukrainian border guards during an artill artillery attack outside Mariupol in the days before the border guards had come to the rescue of a group of Azov fighters and the bullets were their way of saying thank you. Everything in this war is based on personal links. Kiev does nothing explained the Azov Russian volunteer as we sped towards the checkpoint in a civilian Chevrolet. Notice that they're driving civilian cars. Uh, this is significant. Uh, even to this day, uh, Ukrainian military uses civilian vehicles, um, which is, which, you know, when you see a civilian vehicle bombed out uh, on, on a highway, it, it, Usually the Western media immediately assumes or implies that these were civilians in this unmarked civilian vehicle. Um, but as has been going on for eight years, the Ukrainian military is using civilian vehicles on the regular. Um, the boot, the, the, the trunk, full with boxes of bullets and rocket-propelled grenade launchers. One of the windows shot out by gunfire during a recent battle. This is how it works. You go to some hotspot, they see you're really brave, you exchange phone numbers, and next time you can call in a favor. If you need an, an artillery strike, you can get a, a general, uh, you can call a general, and it will take three hours, and you'll and you'll be dead. Or you can call the captain or major commanding the artillery battalion and they will help you out straight away. We are Azov and they know that if they ever need it, we would be there for them. Okay. For the commanders and the generals in Kiev, who, who many in Azov and other volunteer battalions see as responsible for the awful losses of the Ukrainian army, uh, that the Ukrainian army has suffered in recent weeks, especially in the ill-fated retreat from Ilavasvayesk, there was only contempt. Okay. Generals like those in charge of Ilovaisk should be imprisoned for treason, said Skilt. Heads are going to roll for sure. I think there will be a battle for power. The Ukrainian armed forces are an army of lions led by a sheep, said Dmitri, and there is only so long that dynamic, uh, that dynamic can continue. I should say that, um, that uh, Zelensky is not the president at this time. Zelensky comes later and has a much better relationship with the Azov battalion. Um, But at this point, the Ukrainian armed forces uh, are an, quote, an army alliance led by a sheep, said Dmitry. And there's only so long that dynamic can continue. With so many armed, battle-hardened, and angry young men coming back from the front, there is a danger that the rolling heads could be more than a metaphor. Dmitry said he believes that Ukraine needs a strong dictator to come to power who could shed plenty of blood but unite the nation in the process. So the Azov Battalion, neo-Nazi, maybe 
full-blown, I, I guess neo-Nazi is the appropriate word, and um, at least some, some, maybe not all, but some are looking to create a dictatorship in Ukraine, and the leadership in Kyiv is actually afraid of the Azov Battalion. This is in 2014. The same dynamic actually uh, does last quite long, all the way up until the beginning of 2022. Many in the Azov Battalion with whom the Guardian spoke shared this view, which is a long way from the drive for European ideals and democracy that drove the protest in Kiev at the beginning. So during the Maidan Revolution, as the West saw it, they saw the Maidan Revolution as a drive for European ideals and democracy. Uh, but the Azov Battalion, at least, was actually interested in dictatorship. So, so that's, that's something to, to keep in mind, especially the over, and see that's the oversized role that the Azov Battalion has played during the eight years of civil war in Ukraine. Although the Azov Battalion is small in numbers, um, their actual influence on the battlefield in the Donbass and in the on the politics in Kiev uh, is outsized in comparison to their numbers because these are the kind of guys that will kill you if you cross them and glory in it uh, and so uh, the leadership in Kiev, including Zelensky, have been very afraid of the Azov Battalion uh, over the years. The Russian volunteer fighting with the Azov said he believed Ukraine needs a junta that will restrict civil rights for a while, but help bring order and unite the country. So they need a, a military junta. Uh, uh, a junta is a type of government that, that at least in part, uh, part of the leadership, part of the executive, is under the direct control of the military. Often entirely under the control of the military, but sometimes includes uh, civilian uh, leaders as well. So they're looking for a dictatorship, a military junta, something of this sort, and they're willing to assassinate politicians who disagree with their views. This disciplinarian streak was visible inside the battalion itself. Drinking is strictly forbidden. One time there was a guy who got drunk, but the commander beat him, uh, beat him in his face and legs until he could not move. Then he was kicked out, recalled one fighter proudly. Other volunteer battalions have also come under the spotlight. This week, Amnesty International called the Ukrainian government to investigate rights abuses and possible executions by the IDER another battalion. The failure to stop abuses and possible war crimes by volunteer battalions risks significantly aggravating tensions in the east of the country and undermining the proclaimed intentions of the new Ukrainian authorities to strengthen and uphold the rule of law more broadly, said Salil Chetty, Amnesty International Secretary General in Kiev. So the Secretary General of Amnesty International is concerned about war crimes in 2014 being carried out by these voluntary uh, battalions. Fighters from the battalion told The Guardian last month they expected a new revolution in Ukraine that would bring a more decisive military leader to power in sentiments similar to those of many Azov fighters. Uh, and so the, this is uh, someone from the Idar uh, battalion. Despite the desire of many of the Azov to bring violence to Kiev, when the war in the east is over, the battalion receives funding and assistance from the governor of Donetsk region, the oligarch Serhi Taruta. So they're being funded by the government, but they also want to overthrow the government. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, in, in light of January 6th, of course, uh, in the United States, uh, January 6th, uh, 2021, um, 
that kind of sounds familiar, right? <clears throat> An aide to Taruta, Alex Kovzun, said the political views of individual members of Azov were not an issue and denied that the battalion symbol had Nazi undertones. <coughs> the symbol certainly has Nazi undertones. The views of some of these, uh, some of them is their own affair as long as they do not break the law, said Kavzun in written answers to questions. And the symbol is not Nazi, trust me. Some of my family died in concentration camps, so I have a well-developed nose for Nazi shit. Not that well-developed. Um, as well as their frontline duties, the Azov Battalion also functions, uh, the Azov Battalion also function as a kind of police unit, said a platoon commander who goes by the nom de guerre, Kurt. A medieval history buff who takes part in Viking battle reactments and once ran a tour firm in Thailand, Kurt returned to the East Ukraine to join the Azov. He took the Guardian on an overnight patrol through the outskirts of Mariupol and the villages around the front line. Okay, Mariupol was very close to the front line and continued to be very close to the front line all the way up until um, a few weeks ago. And now it's far behind the front lines. Part separatist hunters, part city cops who, with no rules to restrain them, they travel in a convoy of three vehicle, vehicles, all heavily armored uh, civilian vehicles. As the time approached midnight, we set off across the bumpy tarmac roads to the outskirts of Mariupol and soon came across a parked car by the side of the road that the men found suspicious. Fighters dashed from the front two cars and rushed at the vehicle, pointing their guns at it. A startled man got out of the passenger seat, then a sheepish looking woman in a cocktail dress and holding a half-smoked cigarette emerged, smoothing her hair. The Azov fighters apologized, but only after demanding documents and thoroughly searching the car. As we edged closer to the front line, Kurt and the others scanned the skyline with binoculars on the lookout for snipers and separatists. Later, fighters sprinted towards a suspicious jeep parked on the beach while the sea was scanned for hostile support vehicles. But it turned out that again, the men had stumbled upon people just trying to have a good time. A group of women drinking sparkling wine out of plastic cups on the beachfront. The Azov have been partially brought into the military and officially function as a special police unit. There are discussions that Azov and other battalions could be integrated into the army or special forces when the conflict is over. Some of them, however, are hoping that Ukraine will look very different in the not so distant future. And while they may be a tiny minority when it comes to Ukraine as a whole, they have a lot of weapons. Uh, Poroshenko, that's the leader at the time, will be killed in a matter of months, Dmitry said, and a dictator will come to power. What are the policing, uh, what are the police going to do? They could not do anything against the peaceful protesters in Maidan. They are hardly going to withstand armed fighting units, quote unquote, I guess from Dmitry. So this, the Maidan Square is where the main revolution took place uh, in, uh, in Kiev in 2014. This is a few months later. And, um, and the Azov Battalion is looking to overthrow uh, the new leadership, which was trumpeted by the West, especially by Washington, D.C., by uh, President uh, Obama as a Democratic leader. They're looking to overthrow this guy um, because it's just too weak, as was shown by the weakness during the Maidan uh, protest and, and, and coup d'etat. Um, so interestingly, though the point I want to make here is that in 2014, it was okay, it was allowed, let's say, to say neo-Nazi. But in 2022, not allowed to say neo-Nazi. There are certain words which are not mentioned. Are they allowed to? Sure, they're allowed to. But in fact, they don't. And that, that's a really interesting thing. So, you know, there is a lot of concern about Russian propaganda and 
Um, I, you know, to some extent, I find that interesting as well. But um, uh, I'm not really impacted by Russian propaganda. I, I don't ever hear Russian propaganda, right? Uh, hardly ever. Uh, I do, you know, seek it out to try to find out what the actual Russian propaganda is. Um, but it's, it's quite difficult and usually only somewhat direct, often very secondhand. Of course, we do get quotes from Putin and things like that. But, um, but we're not really exposed to much Russian propaganda in the United States. Um, you know, in fact, um, there used to be RT, Russia Today, which was a television station based in Moscow and funded by the government, as a, and, and it was in English. Um, so there's Russia Today, uh, made for United States audience in particular, but also other English speakers throughout the West, in order to give the propaganda uh, from the Kremlin to the outside world, and especially to Westerners and the United States citizens, uh, but Google has shut down RT or uh, uh, YouTube has has deplatformed RT, and um, in the wake of that, Vladimir Putin, uh, the Kremlin, uh, shut down RT altogether because that was their main vehicle for for propagandizing in the West was through YouTube. Uh, so YouTube, Google, uh, Alphabet. Uh, they took it upon themselves to censor this uh, propaganda coming out of the Kremlin. Now we don't know what the Kremlin wants us to hear. We don't get the propaganda. So, um, uh, you know, that's unfortunate because that's a loss of information. Um, and, uh, and, and it should be mentioned that there was a lot of actual critical, uh, there was a lot of content on RT that was critical of Putin and the Kremlin. Uh, the biggest example of which, which is uh, Chris Hedges, who used to work for the New York Times as a foreign correspondent, uh, has covered a lot of wars, and um, uh, you know is 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 against authoritarianism. Uh, you know he worked for RT. He had a show on RT. He was you know sponsored to some extent by by RT. Uh, but he himself, even on his own program on that on that network, was critical of Putin. Um, uh, you know, but it just so happens that he's also very critical of uh, Joe Biden and critical of, of President Trump and critical of President Obama and critical of Hillary Clinton, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this is why he ended up on RT because there's certain things that you cannot say in the mainstream. Uh, what Chris Hedges called the corporate media, meaning uh, business corporations that are, you know, our, our largest uh, journal journalism outlets are actually uh, large transnational corporations um, run typically by people with neoliberal ideology, uh, a, a thing which, you know, Chris Hedges and other people on the left are, are highly critical of. And so, they don't get positions on this, but even if they get a presence like on YouTube, as Chris Hedges did through RT, or uh, get a strong following like in SharePost, this is another, uh, this is a journalistic website that Chris Hedges belonged to, um, headed by Bob Shear, an old time uh, leftist journalist uh, in the best tradition of solid uh, American journalism. Uh, they had quite a following, and, and their website was essentially deplatformed by Google, Alphabet, whatever, um, just by altering the algorithms on Google search. Uh, and so they've struggled, you know, essentially gone out of business um, and are trying to figure out new ways. But uh, this is the kind of censorship that goes on in the United States. So there is, there is a kind of censorship that goes on in the United States, and some of it is self-censorship, like with the Associated Press, we saw that example of self-censorship so that they wouldn't say the word neo-Nazi. Obviously, they were 
I mean, not obvious, but I suspect that they were actually looking at this Sean Walker article while, you know, conducting the story. But at some point along the line, they took out the word neo-Nazi. And, and was that the, the journalist or was that maybe some editor at a higher level? Uh, who knows? But there are certain words that just are not said. Can they be said? Well, yeah, but you might lose your job. But you can say it, just lose your job. I mean, that's what happened to Chris Hedges. Um, when he was working for the New York, New York Times, he began to speak out, uh, not even in the newspaper, but just in uh, personal appearances, he began to speak out against the war in Iraq. And, um, and, and this ultimately led to him being fired or, or resigning, whatever the case may be, from the New York Times, uh, because they just didn't want him criticizing the White House. And this, at this time, this is George W. Bush, right? This is um, the second Bush. Um, so there is a kind of censorship, some of it self-censorship, some of it's de facto censorship. And um, this is much more interesting to me than what's going on in Russia, because I'm not that much impacted by Russian pop propaganda. It's not part of my daily life. But in the United States, the propaganda that goes on here in US journalist outlets, um, you know, if you're thinking about CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, this is where a lot of people get their news from. Um, there's a lot of propaganda going on. And with the Ukraine war, we can see that they all pretty much agree on certain things, especially like, let's fight the Russians to the last Ukrainian, put those Ukrainians on the front line, let them die. Um, there's a lot of warmongering going on amongst journalists, and they're not very objective, and they're not very cool headed, they're, they're really sort of cheerleading uh, a massacre of, of the Ukrainian people. And so it's, it's, a, it's an interesting example, and we can see it happening in our own society. So this is, this is the kind of focus that I want to take, is to look at propaganda as it exists in the United States right now during this war. And, um, and you know, they may maybe also uh, look at uh, the where ideology comes into play. But mostly I, I want to focus on propaganda because we have a a good real world example here of propaganda. And um, I just wanted to do this series of videos um, primarily for my own purposes, just to get my thoughts straight and also to get some of my ideas down uh, on video and, and as a record for myself. So, so that um, as things evolve over the coming weeks, um, I can look back to, to what I was thinking at this point and compare, you know, some of my some of the, my ideas about where I think things are going, compare them to what actually happened. So I want to kind of get this down um, on video so that I have a record uh, to go back to um, because I you know I have a sense that in the coming weeks, you know things are going to shift quite dramatically and, and I just want I want to kind of do this analysis before things change too much. So I think that's all I wanted to say as an introduction. Um, and so, you know, if you're interested, please uh, go on to the further videos and I'll get a little more uh, into specifics about how, um, how, you know, propaganda is taking place. And, and it's all with this historical view, especially over the last eight years since 2014 since the Maidan revolution. And, um, and, and, you know, that's often, I think that's often the way that propaganda works in the United States right now is, especially with uh, Twitter and other social media platforms, the news cycle has become so quick that there's an overload of information and people can't remember, like they don't remember even if they did read it or heard it on the news, you know, saw it on CNN about the Azov Battalion in 2014. Nobody, not every, some people, a large percentage of the population do not remember 
uh, uh, what happened or, or what was reported about the Azov Battalion in 2014. So when they hear the Azov Battalion is holed up in uh, Mariupol's Avastol, uh, you know, this is all Azov stall. Uh, you know, is on the Sea of Azov. This is where the name Azov Battalion comes from. Everybody, even if they heard it, even if they were paying attention enough at the time uh, to digest that originally, uh, most, I would say most, uh, do not remember that information, that knowledge. They've lost that knowledge. And so, as the Associated Press did, by deleting the word neo-Nazi, it helps people forget that, that inconvenient truth. Right? The, the fact that the Azov Battalion is a neo-Nazi uh, regiment within the National Guard, and, and oh, that's what I wanted to say, is, is that um, I think by the end of 2014, certainly by 2015, the Azov Battalion had been wrapped into the National Guard of the Ukraine. And so they became an official military unit of the National Guard and received direct funding uh, from Kiev. Um, <clears throat> so that's all quite interesting considering what was said here. And of course, Kiev could read this article, you know, they had this information. Uh, and they know these guys personally. Um, so, you know, that that not those words not spoken that's part of how propaganda works you just you just let people forget if they're already forgetting don't remind them of something that you, that doesn't fit with what the primarily the white house uh wants people to believe you know they want to believe they the white house joe biden wants people to believe that that the 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 um the Marines and other military personnel holed up in the Avastol steel plant, he wants them to believe that they're victims. And if you mention that they're neo-Nazis, people may not find them as worthy of victimhood. Um, and, 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 so, uh, and so the Associated Press and the New York Times and the Washington Post and CNN and Fox News and, and, uh, and I also wanted to mention in this list like NPR and uh, PBS NewsHour, you know, these are more of the really middle of the road NPR and, and PBS NewsHour. These are, you know, very good journalistic sources in the United States. Nonetheless, they engage in the same kind of propaganda by not mentioning that Azov is a neo-Nazi regiment. Um, you know, if people are going to forget, just let them forget and don't don't trouble them with this. Uh, it just it helps the narrative that Joe Biden wants to tell uh, by not mentioning that. Okay, but what if you do remember? Right? And that's sort of, sort of the thing that irks me is, you know, don't, don't feed me a line. I remember the Azov Battalion. I've been hearing about these guys for eight years. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't know. What are, you, what are you trying to say? That they're not neo-Nazis? Or you're just hoping I'm forgetting? I don't, I don't know. What are you trying to accomplish? Um, and that's that's why this kind of stands out to me and and it does irk me i mean it just it's really like it makes me uneasy and so um and so i want to uh, maybe help you become uneasy about this too and see the way that propaganda is working in the media and i and i imagine that you know a lot of people are just paying attention to ukraine for the first time even uh, now, and, and all this history from just eight years of history, not that much history, is, uh, you know, not even, wasn't even digested in the first place, you know, so then that, not mentioning that Azov, uh, the Azov regiment is, you know, seated with lots of neo-Nazis, um, you know, just helps to make people uh, kind of get on the side of, of NATO in this whole, in this whole, uh, affair. All right, so 
I'll leave it at that, and uh, I hope you join me in the future videos, and um, I'll see you there. Or you'll see me there. Okay.